Uh, I, I'm David with All Tech is Human outside of myself. We also have Elisa, who you've seen running around here from the team. We have Rebecca and Josh and Sarah, so do talk to them. Raise your hand if this is the first time you've been at an All Tech is Human gathering. So good amount of people. So thank you for showing up. I'm glad you are here. As you see, it's a packed house. They're literally turning people away. I think I see people waiting outside the door. The reason is, it's because at All Tech is Human, we're making New York City the global hub for the responsible tech movement, right? So yeah, give it up for that. Because a global hub doesn't, depend on just a few thought leaders, a few people sitting around in a room. It depends on a community coming together, leveraging collective intelligence, airing their commonalities and their differences, understanding our values, what we see in the world and what we want for our tomorrow. That's everything we're trying to do. We're creating the world's largest multi-stakeholder, multi-disciplinary network in responsible tech. And we're doing this so we can tackle these wicked tech and society issues while moving at the speed of tech, leverage that collective intelligence of the community, and diversify the types of people who are involved in this field to better match the complexity of the problems we face. In other words, when we're talking about data privacy, like we're talking about today, these are not easy issues. These are issues that deal with human behavior, engineering, business, law. We need all walks of life involved in this process, and that's what we're doing here today. Just lastly, before I bring up Maggie from Consumer Reports, say a few words. I just want to say, as Sandra mentioned, there's so many different ways to get involved with All Tech is Human. That's what we're set up as, a meta connector for people, organizations, and ideas of this responsible tech movement. Sandra was in charge of a list of over 600 orgs we just released in our Responsible Tech org list. You can download that resource for free on our site, like our Responsible Tech Guide. Or if you want to create and add your own voice to this, get involved in one of our working groups. We have over 200 people right now getting involved in our six open working groups. We also have a large mentorship program and a Slack community of over 7,000 members across 88 countries. In other words, it's not about just the people you see on stage. It's about everybody you see on your left, or your right, in front of you, and behind you. Tech needs to be created in our collective vision. And in order for that to happen, in order for it to be aligned with the public interest, we need to have the public involved. And that's why I'm so grateful that you're all here today, being part of this conversation that needs all of us, needs all of us to come together to co-create a better tech future. So without further ado, I'm just gonna bring up Maggie from Consumer Reports to say a few words. Give it up for Maggie if you wanna grab a mic. That was almost a disaster. Hi, I'm Maggie um, I, from Consumer Reports, thank you. Uh, I wanna start with three little moments from my life before I tell you a little bit about our nonprofit. So one is that, imagine me at age 12 on a cruise with my grandmother it was a terrible time. It was fine, not traumatic, just terrible. And fast forward 25 years, I live in a different state, I'm fully grown, um, and I receive in the mail a glossy postcard that says, remember how great that cruise was, wouldn't you love to buy another one? 25 years later. A second moment is um, a very stressful week after I had an online stalker threaten my life, where I spent the week deleting photos from the internet and um, trying to delete all of my information from people finder sites so people couldn't look at my phone number. The third moment was just two weeks ago, sitting with my roommates in my house, when we realized that both of my roommates were getting advertisements related to a very specific medical condition that I have. And all of these things seem like they could be unrelated, but they're not. <laughs> they are all <laughs> part of this fantastic, enormous web that we call surveillance capitalism. They're all just three little tendrils coming off of it. Um, and that's what we're all here today to talk about, is tackling these tendrils from different angles. So I'm Maggie Oates. I'm a privacy researcher. I'm an artist. I'm also a 
policy analyst by day. I work with consumer reports doing policy analysis for them. I have my phone here because I need to get some numbers right or the fact check team will murder me. So for those who don't know, Consumer Reports is an 88-year-old nonprofit focused on consumer testing, safety, uh, research, and we're probably best known for the work our testing team does, doing independent testing on mattresses and cars and lawnmowers, smartphones. Um, but recently, uh, we've been branching out to also cover privacy and security topics, and um, we've really hit the ground running. Um, following our history of working in a variety of advocacy issues from the safety of cigarettes to let's maybe not put lead in children's toys. <laughs> um, we've been following that into the digital realm. And I want to make sure everyone here knows that it is a really juicy moment to be working in privacy. It's a really critical moment to be working in this topic. Uh, so just in the past few years we've been doing this, we've been seeing the impact of our research. So last week we released two reports that have been in the works for about a year. One asked hundreds of people to donate their Facebook data, to download it, donate their marketing data to us to analyze. And um, one of our findings from that was that each consumer had been identified as a target for a company on average by at least 2,230 companies. And another study we just put out also last week investigated loopholes in health data, trying to figure out why my roommates <laughs> know my medical conditions. Um, and we're seeing this impact. So years ago, also after Consumer Reports put out a study about data sharing on GoodRx, the, the drug coupon site you might know, um, the FTC cracked down and brought a $1.5 million settlement against them. So it's working. <laughs> And we're also doing advocacy and legislative work as well. Um, we've been able to help contribute to dozens of the new state data protection laws that have come out in the past five years. Um, and most of those laws enable consumers to use data rights to opt out of the sale of their data or delete their data, apply for the people finder sites that ruin stalkers' days. And um, while we're really excited about those new data rights, what we're even more excited about is collectivizing those making it human, <laughs> usable by the everyday person. And that's why we're really excited about um, pushing towards universal rights. So whether it's a technical tool, a legal tool, um, we've seen California pass the Delete Act after we're like, please, can we just opt out of all the data sales at once? <laughs> California was like, all right, we'll try that. Um, we've seen regulators start to pick up technical tools that let you enact rights all at once instead of having to do it one by one at each company. Um, and I, yeah, I'm excited because we're just getting started. Um, I live in Pennsylvania, I'm a Pittsburgher. So this is my first All Tech is Human event. Um, so I live in a state that doesn't have any of these rights, which is kind of a bummer, but I am really optimistic that that's gonna change uh, really soon. Not even like an in my lifetime thing, but probably in the next two or three years. And so what I see when I look across this room is momentum. I see the opportunity to grab some of these tendrils and start attacking them. Um, and tonight you're going to be hearing from a wonderful group of people who all are attacking this web surveillance capitalism from their own manner. And um, I will yield the floor to them so you can hear from them. Thank you so much. All right, let's keep it going for Maggie. So without further ado, we're gonna keep up the momentum and after this incredible panel, we hope you can talk to some of the panelists, but also check out Consumer Reports and their demos, talk to everyone. They're very friendly, showing us over there. So do go stage left and talk to the, all of them and talk to one another. So right now, keeping up the momentum, I'm just gonna bring out our entire panel, starting with Jennifer Strong, and we got Ginny Foz, Joy Angwin, and Tracy Chow. Let's give it up for all of them. Here you go. And then we're going to hand you the cards. Okay. All right. okay. Thank you, everybody, for being here. We're just going to go straight to some introductions. I don't know. Do um, you want to kick us off? Hi, everyone. My name is Ginny Foz. I work at Consumer Reports in the Innovation Lab, um, where I'm a director of product and R&D. I'm really th thrilled to be here tonight. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Julia Angwin. I'm a New York Times contributing opinion writer. 
longtime investigative journalist and um, relevant to this room, wrote a book called Dragnet Nation um, about privacy almost 10 years ago. Hi, I'm Tracy Chow. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Block Party, which builds consumer tools for online safety and privacy. All right, before we should talk about why people should care about data privacy, I want to ask each of you, why do you care? And how did you come to care? Sure, I can start. Uh, I started my career working at a small startup uh, that was working in the reproductive health space um, gathering fertility data through a slate of different apps. Um, and I was a digital marketer there. So my job was to find people who uh, were considering having children or were otherwise thinking about their fertility um, and to advertise this great app to them. Um, and through that job, I learned both one, how easy it was to target people in these very sensitive and private moments of their lives. And then two, um, I got to see under the hood of how a lot of startups run a little fast and loose with data um, and that there aren't many mechanisms uh, or incentives to be really careful about how consumer data is handled. Um, and so being in this environment and looking at the immense sensitivity of the data my company was collecting and, and thinking about what would need to change in the world for us to treat this data differently um, is what brought me to this work. Um, I grew up in Silicon Valley, and I thought I would go into tech. I started coding in fifth grade and um, worked at Hewlett Packard in my summers. And so I grew up with this idea of software as um, something in a box that was sold at a store, shrink wrapped. I don't know if anyone here is old enough to remember that, but it did used to actually be in a box, and it was like 60 dollars is really expensive and um, then I fell in love with journalism and was like screw tech I'm gonna be a journalist and then unfortunately or fortunately um, my editors realized I was the only person in the newsroom who understood this whole computer thing so I started writing about tech and it was about um, 2008 I think when I was writing a book about MySpace another thing maybe not everyone remembers but um, I I was writing about it and I thought, you know, it's so interesting, this model, they're not selling software. Like essentially MySpace was software that was free, right? Because it let you build a website about yourself but not have to know how to code. And they were selling access to your data. Essentially they were allowing advertisers to target you. And as a Wall Street Journal reporter, I thought this is a new, weird, creepy business model. Like they're selling data and selling, instead of selling the box. And so when I came back from book leave, I pitched my editors on this idea of like, we should do a big series about privacy and that they're selling your data. And they were all like, what? Who's selling our data? That's crazy. They had no idea. And so I began a series of investigative reports on privacy and it was really early. It was 2010, I think, when our first articles appeared. And I just want to say that I was greeted with derision by the tech industry who was like, the she just doesn't understand, right? And Jeff Jarvis, I'll never forget, said that I was going to um, destroy the internet. Um, <laughs> and so every time I see him, I tell him that I'm gonna give him one minute heads up before the internet goes down. <laughs> came to care about privacy from two different perspectives. The first is looking at the systems and realizing how broken they were, and the other is a more personal perspective. The first came from working as an intern at Facebook in 2008 before they cared at all about privacy. I would hear stories of people messaging their friends in college being like, yo, bro, just like ask her out already. I see you checking out her Facebook profile all the time. I was like, oh, that's a violation of privacy of your friends too. But just the way that Facebook treated data internally, very cavalierly, I think they will deny all of this, but they've definitely buttoned things down back then. It did not matter. Everybody had root access to all the databases. Like it did not matter what you wanted to look at, people would write scripts and notify them if girls were checking out their profiles. As you may guess, the engineering teams were mostly male. Um, so 
I was still a baby software engineer that I did not understand that this was a thing that people could just do and felt so comfortable doing. So that made me feel a little bit icky and weird, not just like the selling of the data and access to advertising, but just the way that the people who are making technology treated user privacy made me feel a little off. The second perspective, which has made me really care about privacy and motivated my work now with Block Party, is um, from having been a diversity and inclusion activist, building a little bit of a profile online, and then having the experience that many women who are mildly visible at all online have, which is dealing with the harassers and stalkers and all sorts of weird trolls. Um, so I've gotten the parasocial stalkers who imagined that they were in relationships with me and would show up where I was in person physically after flying around the world, um, which made me very sensitive to location data, uh, where I live, any like, just very, very sensitive to anything um, geolocation, physical location related. Uh, but I've also dealt with the horrible trolls on Reddit and 4chan, um, where they've launched DDoS attacks on my company, on Block Party, like the people who don't like you building anti-harassment software will come harass you for it. So we've dealt with those trolls and it's just made me worried for my personal safety. Um, I don't think I'm doing anything that horrible, but when the internet trolls go after you and decide they want to launch the mob after you, it is very scary. So that is why I care about privacy and think about it in almost everything I do day to day, like what photos I'm willing to post, what things I'm willing to mention publicly, never mention any patterns of behavior where you go running, your favorite coffee shops, anything that can identify where you live, no photos outside your windows, where you live, like all of those things. Like every day I think about my privacy and this OPSEC. Now, Julia, you mentioned something when we were talking the last time about when you were working on a book, what was it? It was some years back about privacy that you thought you were being a little bit, maybe you were overdoing it or that you were... Well, but now you feel like you actually, it's so, so much worse than you even realized. Yeah, I started writing this book about privacy in um, 2013, I guess, and it came out in 2014. And um, I I was worried that I was um, being kind of hysterical or something, right? Because at that point, it was still kind of the Jeff Jarvis world where it was like, Everyone was just like, why are you worried? It's just creepy ads. Like, no big deal. You just, they're just ads. This data isn't going anywhere. It's not being used for your, to give you health insurance rates. It's not being used for anything significant. Um, and and I was really concerned that it would be used for all those things. And it would there were already signs that it was going to be that way. And, um, and so I wrote this book and thought, okay, I hope I'm not being too crazy here. Um, and 10 years later, I look back at that book and I was not paranoid enough. Like literally, I, I thought facial recognition, for instance, was going to take much longer to be adopted because at that time it was really bad. And so, you know, I wrote about the threat of it, but I was like, eh, you know, but luckily these computers are really bad at figuring out your face. And so like, we're probably going to be fine. And that was just not true. In fact, it's interesting to note that the thing that made facial recognition get good is AI. So you know what's funny about AI is it's sometimes not clear what it's good at, right? If you use ChatGPT, you might have the experience of like, why a lot of people think this thing is good. Like sometimes it's good and sometimes it's really bad. Um, but AI is really good at increasing facial recognition. So from 10 years ago, the error rates in facial recognition were 30%. So 30% incorrect, it's now 0.03% because of AI. And so we're at this incredible inflection point where the surveillance is so good, right? Even the error rates, and it's true the error rates are, are still worse for people of color, and particularly for women of color, but even so, it's within such a smaller band. And I think one thing that's really important to think about with the AI conversation is that AI is super powering the surveillance that's already out there. And that is very scary. Yes. And I feel like something that's poorly understood, if at all, about this is like in the age that we're living in now, your ability to opt out and stay opted out is uh, an AI model is not a database, right? You can't just go in and subtract a line and then it's fine. Also, the ability to be forgotten is predicated on being remembered. 
because otherwise, if you opt out of a system and you walk by the camera, the next day you're opted back in, unless there's a copy of your face somewhere to allow people to take you back out again. Yeah, which is why opt out is the wrong model. So why don't we talk about that? Let's talk about some of the ways in which people can begin to take back their privacy. Do you want to start? Yeah, I'm happy to, although I also wanted to react to something Julia brought up. I think it's an, an interesting question. What is the right level of alarm on privacy to express publicly? Like working at a consumer organization, we know that 96% of consumers are concerned about their privacy and security online. But I still think that very far from 96% of consumers are doing much about that other than just being fearful. And I, I completely agree with you that like there should be more alarm out there. But I also think a lot of people or certainly more people um, every day and every year are becoming more cognizant of these issues. And so then I think it gets to this question of like, what can we equip people with so that when they feel that alarm or that fear, they don't feel powerless? Um, it's one of the reasons why we've put so much investment in at Consumer Reports into um, this product called Permission Slip, which is an easy to use tool. It's a mobile app. You can download it and uh, swipe through companies, understand what data companies are collecting about you, and then use your right to opt out, use your right to delete, and just making those rights feel more accessible so that when people are despairing or are having some fear, there is a place to turn. It's not going to solve every problem, but it is a thing that one can do. Um, and, and And I think that that is a way to channel some of this kind of fear that people feel, even if they're not expressing it all the time, into like an action one can take. Yeah, and is it just fear? I think it's also overwhelm. And overall, this sense of, well, and I don't like how it's framed either. I think we often put this as technical people will have an easier time versus non-technical people. And it distracts from the fact that this is legitimately hard and it was designed to be hard. It's not really about how technical you are. I think it also feels like you just can't opt out of most things. Like you go to the airport now and they just scan your face. Like at what point did I tell them they were going to be able to scan my face, let me through? And like, well, I don't, I don't know how to get out of this anymore. I think often it just feels like, well, Facebook is going to target ads to me. And like, unless I want to live a life in a cave where I don't touch anything digital, like I'm, I'm, this is just the world we live in now. So it feels like there's not much you can do. I just want to say you can opt out at the airport. I do it every time on the, <laughs> and they hate you for it, but I'm that person. And so I highly recommend <laughs> because one of the things here is that we don't have a lot of agency, right? Um, and so I think that although these moves of me opting out at the, and making the gate agent's life difficult, which I do feel bad for that person because it's not their fault, but I think it's our one, one way of voting, right? Because we don't have politicians who are running on privacy, or at least I haven't seen anyone running on that issue. So we don't have a lot of opportunities as citizens to express our, our, our interest in this topic. And so I think participating in opt-outs and delete, um, deleting your data and all that is, A, it's somewhat helpful. It's not fully helpful. But B, it's a way of voting, I think. Absolutely. And on this point of participation, like, if people use the new privacy laws that are increasingly existing, that becomes evidence for why there need to be more privacy laws, why there might need to be a federal privacy law, for example. So I completely agree that finding the ways to participate ends up being the argument for the continued evolution of um, policy, of tools, of more investment going here generally. Right, because the companies always say, oh, no one cares. They didn't, nobody adjusts their privacy settings, so therefore we can make an argument to government that no one cares. And so I think we have to show that we do care. Yeah. I think that is something interesting about the tools, right? The sense of a collective voice in a way versus just each person for their own. And perhaps, as you were just saying, having a group of people gives a little evidence to those with more power than we have as individuals to make change. I want to speak a little bit more about the tools as well. And Jenny was already starting to talk about this with permission slip, making it easy for you to opt out and exercise your rights. There is a greater space of these privacy tools now, Privacy Party, that Block Party Builds is another one of these, where we're really trying to make it easy for people to participate in these actions to assert their rights and change the defaults. A lot of the platform companies are not going to make it easy for you. And so then they subtly use that uh, difficulty in the user experience as an excuse for people don't care about this because they make it impossible for you to do anything. Of course, people aren't going to do it if it 
takes 30 minutes to find the setting buried in Facebook that will you know, actually hide away the things that you want to hide away. Um, using these tools is also a way of voting, um, participating in the building of these tools and advocating for them. The other thing about the tools that's really fascinating is that they can be the um, evidence that the privacy laws work and they are the implementation of these privacy laws. There are um, laws that are coming into effect where you can't actually exercise the rights really until somebody builds an app like Permission Slip. So California had a privacy law that made it so you should be able to exercise your rights. But like what consumer knows how to exercise this right? And when people are building tools like Consumer Reports is building Permission Slip, it makes it possible to see what the instantiation of these laws is in technology so people can actually use them. Well, and another lever for influence too um, is like getting the company to invest more in their privacy program and their privacy tooling. So the privacy parties of the world that show you how to use the privacy settings that exist on a lot of the websites that have the most data about us and, and the most sensitive data about us then becomes a case to that organization that these tools are getting used. These tools like need to exist. They need to be refined. Similarly for permission slip where uh, we're sending data requests to companies every day. We find that companies get on the phone with us shocked at how many data privacy requests they're receiving and asking us how they can be better at processing them, how they can be more efficient at um, executing on these privacy requests they're receiving. Um, and that too ends up kind of removing friction that these teams are facing internally in their organizations to make privacy more of a priority. I want to make sure we have time to get to your questions on the floor, and Julia's got a heart out coming up soon. So um, before we do that, though, we I don't want to say we're being negative because we're not, but <laughs> is there something here that um, is making you hopeful? Is there something you want to share that makes you feel like this will get better? Because I do think that probably all four of us genuinely believe there is a future where this is better. No. I mean, this room is full, and that's really exciting. When I first started talking about this a long time ago, it was just like me and three people. <laughs> um, so that is wonderful. And I do feel like also one thing that um, I think is true is that the younger generation is much smarter about privacy. I know that my kids who are teenagers are super smart about it. They don't, they do most of their stuff in disappearing messages. They use Instagram basically as a billboard, like only things that you would actually want the entire public to have. They have multiple rings of friendship on on the, so I think that they are smarter than my generation, certainly smarter than my parents. So I think people are getting better at it, but that is an unfair thing because we shouldn't have to become experts at it. There should be a baseline of your data won't be used for all these, let's make a list of 10 terrible things and that should be just off the table. And unfortunately, we're not at that point. Sorry, I'm, that wasn't positive. <laughs> I think I'm heartened by the regulation that is starting to come into effect. Europe is moving much faster than the US on this, obviously. But the fact that Europe is passing things like GDPR was a number of years ago, but DSA and DMA, there's a lot more regulation in this space. And the regulation reflects general population sentiment as well. Like They wouldn't be pushing these things through if people didn't care. Like that is hopeful to me that there's more literacy around what data privacy means, what data rights are, um, these different concepts that people maybe didn't understand before around interoperability and portability of data. Many more people now know and are pushing for them, and we're starting to see that reflected in regulation. Hopefully, we'll see that in the U.S. soon. There's starting to be more privacy laws, at least introduced at the state level. There's some discussion at federal level. Hopefully, there will be a little bit more... Uh, success in getting things through soon. Yeah, I would certainly second that. Uh, when I joined Consumer Reports, there were two states that had privacy laws, and now there are over a dozen. So um, that, and I've I've been in this role for um, about three years. So it's like a pretty pretty nice pace of um, new privacy laws being adopted. I would say the other thing that makes me optimistic is that consumers are using these rights on mass. Uh, when we announced Permission Slip in October of this year, within the first week of the app being publicly available, we had sent um, one million data rights requests to companies. And so, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I mean, 
to me, that is evidence of the pent up demand for these rights. And that as soon as these rights become more legible, more convenient for people to exercise, that there is going to be a groundswell of interest in action. All right. So I have a stack of questions from the floor. Keep them coming if you have more um, that you want to pass over. So uh, here's one. What are your suggestions for educating youth on how to protect their data privacy on social? I feel like the youth should be educating the seniors on this. <laughs> is that just our teenagers, Julia, or is that all teenagers? I don't know. Um, no, I mean, I think everyone needs education. And also, um, all of those privacy settings, as you know, are they change all the time. They default, like you change it, and then it defaults back to something. So it's designed to be complicated. And I think that, honestly, it would be great if they did some of that in school. Um, I had terrible experience with my kids in school where um, in both of my kids, they were told to, everyone in the room was told to use the same password. Yeah. And then the teachers thought that was a brilliant idea. And then all the kids would hacking into each other's accounts. And so it was really bad. I had a, a, an app put on my daughter's phone by her school in junior high that had the location data of all the students. In theory, this made it so that when they came back from lunch, we would know where everybody was at. But instead, what it meant, my daughter would turn off her location as soon as she got out at three o'clock and the teacher said, Oh, she's, you know, so good. She has no screen time. No, but she was, uh, she had turned off the app and she could see where her teachers were, including one that went to a bar every night. So uh, <laughs> another question from the floor, how to handle data pollution and deep fakes? Anyone want to take a run at this? I mean, one thing about, um, those are two t different things, but deep yes. fakes, I would say right now, the evidence is that they're really hard to detect. Um, they're hard to detect through automation. They're hard to detect manually. And so we're entering into a really difficult time period, particularly as an, in an election year, where um, we aren't going to know what is real. And I'm really worried about this polluting everything, right? Because the idea that you can't figure out if a piece of information is fake or not actually means that every single piece of information is now not trustworthy. And building an entire information ecosystem that is not trustworthy only benefits bad actors. And that's where we're heading. We're at a massively fast pace right now. <laughs> um, and so I guess I'm not winning at the optimism game. <laughs> but I will say um, last week I held an um, event where I brought in election officials from across the U.S. to test AI for election integrity and whether voters were going to be manipulated by things. And the, I'm going to be publishing the results in a couple of weeks, but it was bad. <laughs> well, I'm curious if anything has surprised you throughout your work, either about the privacy space itself or the work that you've been doing, whether something noteworthy is top of mind that has surprised you throughout this. I've recently been talking to a lot of users and potential users of our product privacy party and try to understand like what is the mentality that people have in thinking about online safety and privacy. And I've been in particular trying to talk to people who don't identify as privacy nerds or people who are already very savvy it turns out everybody is thinking about their privacy in different ways. They may not think about it in those terms, but so many people already have their own policies for what they share or don't share online. Um, a lot of folks would say, I don't mention any people who are close to me, like my family, my partner, my friends. Like, If they don't have a big online presence, I don't mention them. I don't want to tag them in any photos. I don't want to publish anything. A lot of women I talk to, like don't post photos of where I am in real time. Like everybody has worked out these ways to safeguard themselves. Like everybody is conscious of how they move through space online and um, in the you know, physical world and cares about these issues, maybe not in the same language that privacy people talk about things. So it feels like there may be a little bit disconnect, but this is a very mainstream sort of set of concerns. I'll say too, I've been really pleasantly surprised by all of the citizen scientists out there who want to help us figure out how the surveillance economy works and want to help us figure out how to make these laws work for people. Um, I think Maggie mentioned in the introduction that Consumer Reports just published a study, um, who's sharing my data with Facebook? 
uh, in which over 700 people downloaded their Facebook data and donated this, some of their most sensitive data, to us for analysis so that we could better understand the surveillance economy. There's actually a similar story in kind of the earliest days of creating Permission Slip, where we partnered with hundreds of Californians to test how the CCPA was working on the ground. And people are really willing to give of their time and attention to help us become smarter about how privacy is playing out on the ground, um, which to me brings me both a lot of hope um, and kind of a lot of gratitude. I found something hopeful to say, <laughs> which is that privacy does appear to be one of the only bipartisan issues and is overwhelmingly popular with the public, right? When California had their ballot initiative, it won by a landslide. And so I do think there is actually this like, groundswell that is growing and lawmakers are responding somewhat inadequately, but I, I think hopefully we'll get there. Yep. And we're going to need to leave it there because we're out of time. Thank you, ladies, very much. And thank you to all of you for being here.